Hey church family, happy Sabbath from Katie, Denise, and Todd. Hope that everybody's having a great Sabbath and uh, you've listened to some great preaching and maybe studied your Sabbath school lesson and uh, hope all of our kids are into their Sabbath school lesson. And um, speaking of our kids, please remember to be praying for our kids every day when you get up if, if, if you can and several times throughout the day, if you think about it as they're in this last push, about a month or so left of school, that they can finish strong. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Don't forget prayer meeting, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Watch for the link. Um, wonderful stuff. Pastor's just about to finish up. Matthew, some great discussion going on amongst the group, and so we want to invite everybody to join if, if, if you can, please. Um, also, Elena should be just about to the house in another, just maybe a, a week or so, so remember her and all the student missionaries as they get ready to come home. And don't forget all of our young people in the armed services, Miss Andrea and uh, Mr. Harry Jr. And, and all that our loved ones that may be out there. Um, also, I want to let you know that, that uh, Denise and I will be absent from these little sermonettes for the next two weeks. We're going to miss the next two Wednesdays because we film these on Wednesdays. She pushes <coughs> them out for Sabbath. But we'll be leaving next week to go up to be with Katie for her graduation from Southern Adventist University. And so we're super excited about that. We're gonna miss doing these for you guys, but we'll catch up when we get back and hopefully have some great stories to share from our trip. Um, so having said that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father God, as we uh, look into the book of Luke chapter five tonight, we ask that you would just guide us and bless us today. Lord, be with all of our church family, Lord, no matter where they may be. we got some loved ones traveling and whatnot. So, Lord, just uh, bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's do uh, one song here to get started up here. You can see that, hopefully you can see that beautiful screen that Miss Denise has going up there. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, real quick as we get into our Sabbath school for our kids, I um, just want to share with you, this is the book that I was talking about last week, but it, it never made it into the sermonette. And I just want to apologize for that. We had an alarm go off on the phone and, and instead of me just letting it to do its thing, I stepped up to, to swipe it off and when I did the video stopped and then we recorded a, a number two section and a number three section and all week long it would not do anything with any of them and finally Miss Denise was able to work the first one out which was 90% of it and then uh, parts two and three I kind of tried to, to type up in what she emailed out. So anyhow this is the book that um, I got from Miss Geneva's library and I highly recommend it. It's super good. I love Jerry Thomas. And it is Conversations with Jesus, What You Wish You Could Say and What You Long to Hear. And so it's taking some great, great stories um, about Jesus' interaction with people and it's just taking a really good spin on it. So highly recommend that. All right, for our kids, 
um, last week, hopefully. And for all of our church members, you guys got number four. And I'll have to uh, be honest. I don't know if you guys were like me trying to cross out all the love through that paragraph to, to get it. Um, but as I got to the end, this is what I got. And I hope you got something similar. It's 2 Corinthians 9, 18 at the bottom. And it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you at you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And so we hope that you guys had some good success on that, hopefully. And so we'll put that here. And now this week, uh, guys, we're on number five. And so Miss Denise will be emailing this out when she sends the sermonette. And this is going to be, as you read the instructions, you're going to be covering up one word in this segment. And then as you cover up these words, that will leave a phrase there. And so this will be for the upcoming week. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we get back. All right, let me get my machine here. All right, so we're going to start off with our mission story. Again, all this stuff, your, your starting point um, is juniorpowerpoints.org. And that's where the lessons are found, the teacher's lessons, the mission stories, just a lot of great free stuff. And so um, if you've got internet, um, you should be able to pick this up free of charge. And, and adults, um, your, your adult Sabbath school lessons are out there as well free. So today we are going to learn about Ethan. And he is 10, and there's the flag. You can see that we are still in Trinidad and Tobago. And we're going to talk about traveling mercies. It says, Ethan's family likes to have adventures. Once Ethan and father and mother traveled seven days by train on the Trans-Siberian Railroad in Russia. Another time, they rented a camper van and traveled around Australia for three weeks. But the one trip that Ethan will never forget took place in his home country. Early Sunday morning, Ethan piled into the car with father and mother to go to the beach on the Caribbean Sea. Before turning on the ignition, father prayed as the family always did before a trip. Heavenly Father, we ask for your traveling mercies on this journey. He prayed, please guide us as we go to the beach. Thank you. And the family set off for the beach. It was a pleasantly warm morning. The beach wasn't too crowded, and Ethan happily splashed in the water around, around noon. However, the sun grew hot, and the beach became crowded. Let's go home, Mother said. The family piled back into the car. Father sat behind the steering wheel, and Mother sat beside him. Ethan sat behind Father in the back seat. The family talked merrily as they rode along the forested mountain road, and suddenly, bam, a terrific crash shook the car. The sound of breaking glass and crunching metal pierced the air. The car jolted to a stop. Father turned around and looked at Ethan. Ethan, are you okay? He asked back. The boy was sitting calmly in the back. He didn't have a scratch. Yes, I'm fine, Ethan said. What happened? Something fell on the car, Father said. Mother was screaming. She didn't hear Father and Ethan's conversation. Is Ethan okay? She screamed. He's fine, Father said. He's fine. People quickly surrounded the car. Someone wanted to call an ambulance. Someone else offered water. Ethan, father, and mother got out of the car. They, were, they weren't hurt at all. Don't worry about calling an ambulance, father said. We're fine. Ethan looked at the car. The windshield was shattered and the front of the car was smashed in. The front of the car, in the front of the car lay an enormous tree. The tree had fallen from a cliff high above the road and landed on the car. Now the tree was lying across the entire road, blocking traffic in both directions. It was a miracle that Ethan and his parents were alive. If the tree had fallen a few seconds later, it would have hit the car roof right above Ethan's head. It's a good thing that we prayed for traveling mercies, Ethan said. Father and mother immediately agreed. Thank you, Jesus, Father said. Thank you, Jesus. After that day, mother always reminds Ethan that it is very important to pray for traveling mercies. If you, want, if you reach out to him, he will protect you, she says. Father kept a piece of the tree as a reminder of God's traveling mercies. That's a neat idea, isn't it? When Ethan sees the piece of tree, he remembers that God is always with him and that he can be grateful for his protection. He likes to pray before the family goes on adventures. Dear God, please be with us as we travel. 
And please give us traveling mercies, he, mercies, he prays in Jesus' name, amen. Ethan and his parents, Leon and Corinne, attend the University Church at the University of Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago. Your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago went to help build a new university church. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offerings that help spread the gospel around the, the entire world. And now here's just a, a neat little fun fact for you. It says the only new acoustic instrument invented in the 20th century came out of Trinidad's oil industry. Steel pans or steel drums are considered the island's national instrument and the first ones were made from oil drums. Calypso music and steel drum bands feature in carnival celebrations on both islands. And there's a picture of a steel drum. And if you've ever heard that, it's just wonderful music. Miss Denise especially likes that. Great story about travel mercies. That's something that I wanna encourage all of you young people to do as you and your parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles or anybody start off on a trip or a school trip to always have prayer. That's one of the things that Denise always does when we start on our travels to go see Katie is she has that travel mercy prayer. So wonderful, wonderful. All right, so now let's do a little recap of last week here. And we were on lesson four of last week. And remember, that was Jesus on the road to, to Emmaus. And we had um, some homework questions, if you had a chance. It said, on the walk to Emmaus, Jesus explained to them what they really needed. And we were going to look up some texts to find out what those disciples really needed. So our first one was found in Matthew 1, 21. And the answer mm -hmm. was, he will save people from sin. In John 3, 16, we all know that, I think, right? Those who believe in him will have everlasting life. And the next part, John 3, 17, did not come to condemn, but to save. John 16, 31, believe in Jesus and you will be saved. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And the last one on 1 John 4, 9, God showed his love. He sent his son that we might live through him. So I hope that you guys had a chance to look that up. And uh, we're now going to jump into lesson number five real quick. And this is what you will be looking at if you're looking to uh, online or in your, in your workbook, uh, your Sabbath school book. It is lesson number five, Believing is Seen. And this is a great, great lesson. Our PowerPoint is our faith in Jesus is a witness to those around us. And we're going to be in the book of John today. It says in John 20, 29, the power text, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So we're going to talk about this disciple who was one of, of Jesus's great, great disciples. But we get a very common phrase in society today. And maybe you guys have heard it. It's called, don't be a doubting Thomas. And what that means is that from this story that we're going to go over today, that sometimes when people are skeptical or they don't think something's true, you might have heard your parents or grandparents say, oh, he's just a doubting Thomas. And that's what they're, they're talking about. So today I'm going to read some statements to you for you to think about whether you think what I'm telling you is believable or, or not, whether these are truth or whether I'm, I'm telling a, a fib. The first one is the blue whale can produce the loudest animal sound. At 188 decibels, the noise can be heard more than 500 miles away. What do you think about that? Is that, is that real? Hummingbirds can fly backwards. Though the fur of polar bears is white, they actually have black skin. Horses can see almost everything around them at the same time. Flying squirrels are capable of gliding for distances of up to 295 feet. Bald eagles build very large nests, sometimes weighing as much as a ton. The largest turtle is the leatherback sea turtle. It can weigh more than 2,000 pounds. So guys, what do you think? Are all these statements that I just read, are they fact or are they fiction? Are they true or are, are they fibs? Well, guess what? Every one of those is true. 
And when I first read that, I thought, wow, the, most of this stuff I didn't know. Um, I'm sure many of you might have, have heard some of this, but I think these are all great things. But just because I didn't know it doesn't mean they're not true. And that's what the story is today about Doubting Thomas. You see, we've gone through the Jesus' crucifixion, right? We've gone through him coming out of the tomb. We've gone through him being resurrected and appearing to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus last week. And now we're coming back to the room where the disciples are all gathered. Jesus has made that appearance. He's gone there to them. Uh, he has ate uh, uh, some food with them. He showed them that, that he's real. And everybody was there to see him except Thomas. And Thomas wasn't there. And so what I want you guys to do is this week, for some study, if you get the opportunity, uh, I want you guys to go to John. That's the fourth book of the gospel. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it's book number four of the New Testament. John chapter 20. It's going to be verses 24 through 31. And I want you to read this great story about Thomas and about his doubts, but about how Jesus treats him. And it's a wonderful, wonderful illustration. Now, this week also, if you get the chance, I want you guys to go to three different Bible uh, 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 chapters in the Bible. They're all in the New Testament. So the first two are going to come from the first book of the New Testament in Matthew. So the question is, is in Matthew 14, 25 through 31, when did Peter start to doubt? So that's our question. When did Peter start to doubt? What could have saved him from doubting? And what can we do to avoid doubt? So you're going to look in Matthew 14, 25 through 31. The second question is also found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. It says, what guidelines did Jesus give for doubters? How can we implement them today? So that's something that we can all use, right? So how can we use those in our everyday life? Matthew 21, 18 through 21. And then the last one uh, is the book of Jude, and it's a little small book, and so you may have to kind of dig around through there. Um, but Jude chapter 22, it says, uh, excuse me, I, I think it's, Denise, would you look up real quick Jude and tell me the where it's sandwiched in between? We're going to get that to you to help you look at that. Uh, Jude 22, and the reason I'm asking is, is I think it's so small, I think this might be verse 22 and not mm -hmm. chapter 22. You're talking about Jude? Jude, J-U-D-E. That's right before Revelation. Okay. Right? I don't have a Bible here. So okay, I put her on the spot and I apologize. So we'll we'll try to put that out in the email. I will That's go right and, and find exactly sure. where Jude is at. But it's a little teeny tiny small book. So Jude 22, how should we treat those who doubt? What are some ways you can help someone stop doubting that Jesus loves them? So that's really important, I, I think. Uh, kids, as you grow older, um, you're going to sometimes have doubts, and, and a lot of adults struggle with that. And so when people come across, and, and what can we do yes, to help? Yes, it's right before Revelation. Okay, so Miss Denise looked it up, and so if, you go, if you go clear to the, to the end of the New Testament, that's Revelation. If you back up one chapter, that's where Jude is. And so it's not, so it's Jude verse 22, because it's just one, I think it's just one single page. One chapter. And so it's one chapter, so it's going to be Jude, verse 22. But that can help us to deal with those who are having doubts, especially if Jesus still loves them. So that's your assignment for the week. If, if you have time, uh, we want to encourage you to spend time in your Sabbath school lesson every single week and work on those power texts and those memory verses because they're super, super important. All right, so now we're going to shift gears to the little sermonette. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, um, and we're going to be talking about this. So let me grab my Bible here real quick, and we've already had our prayer. So we're going to read real quick. It's real short. Luke 5 uh, starts off, it says, so it, was the, so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret, it's also the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, 
and ask him to put out a little from the land when he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon, this, this is Peter, Simon said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word will I let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking so they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats as they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For when he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken, and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Great story. I love that story because remember now, these are fishermen. They're struggling. They're, th this is how they earn their living. And they, bought, they brought these two boats to the shore that were so full of fish, they were about on the verge to sink. And the end of that uh, scripture says that they forsook everything and they followed him. They left it all. They left it right there. They turned everything over to Jesus and they gave up fishing and they left that great catch worth a lot of money to follow Jesus. This story is also found in the Messiah. Uh, and that's going to be, if you'll go, it's going to start off on page. Let me get that to you. It's going to be chapter 25, page 149. And this story is so great. Um, what I want to do is I want to encourage you, if you get the opportunity, uh, Denise and I have been watching a series and we're all caught up. But if you go to YouTube, it's called The Chosen. Um, and also, you, there's an app out there that you can get that's all free. And uh, these are wonderful stories. We're into season two now. Uh, and I think they're through about the first three episodes of season two. But these are wonderfully done stories about Jesus as he was here on earth in the New Testament, interacting with his disciples and Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus and, and how he called his 12. And it's just a wonderful story. Denise and I really, really want to, uh, to encourage you if you have the opportunity to watch this. It's totally free. Great acting, super well written. It's just so good. But one of the scenes that, that really struck upon me is if you search in your YouTube and just put the, the chosen, Jesus calls Peter, you're going to see this scene where Peter and James and John and some guys have been out fishing all night long and they're tired, they're exhausted, they've caught nothing. Peter's in a really hard spot because he's got some taxes due. He doesn't know what he's going to do to, to, to feed his family, to pay his house mortgage. And so he's out fishing, trying to get this catch. He comes back dejected, downhearted. He's having some serious doubts. And when he comes up on the shore with everybody else, he sees Jesus is there and is teaching this group of followers. And so he asked Peter, he said, can I stand on your boat so, so they can hear me a little better? And I want you to see the story, so I'm not going to tell you anything else about it, but it's, uh, it's amazingly well done the interaction between Jesus and Andrew and Peter especially. And so as we are doing this, I, I, I thought Jesus has one, one request of these people, follow me, follow me. And as we just read, Peter does, and James and John and Andrew, they give up everything, they follow Jesus. And the question that had me thinking about this during the sermonette was, where are we fishing and for who are we fishing? And as I thought about that, as I thought about a scene that I want to share with you, one of the writers makes a statement in there. He says that Jesus makes us what we are not. And I had Denise read that back where I could write that down so I wouldn't, wouldn't misinterpret that. Jesus makes us what we are not. I thought that is so good. He chose this humble, ragtag bunch of fishermen, and he made them what we are not. He, through them... The word spread to the entire world of Jesus as our Messiah, as our Savior. And so I thought about my own self, and, and maybe you might be thinking this too as you watch this scene, that, that Jesus makes me what I'm not. 
regardless of all my flaws, of all my failures, of all my sins, Jesus makes me what I'm not. And that's such a huge statement. There's a behind the scenes uh, sh shot that tells you how they did this. Because one of the things that I couldn't imagine was how did they get the fish into that net for that scene? It's so incredible. But that was a real problem for the creators of The, the Chosen. And uh, if you uh, aren't uh, mindful about me giving a, a, a little spoiler, I was wondering how did they get those live fish into the net to get them into the boat for that scene? Well, as they were getting ready to film this scene, all their options were running out. The people that they were gonna try to get the live fish from to use for this scene, nothing was coming through. All of their ends were, were, were falling short. And so they needed to come up with a solution, one that they could fill that net up, but they weren't sure how. And so they turned to their special effects guys. And this is something that the special effects team of two men had been doing for 20 years and they'd never come across this problem, didn't know how to solve this problem. They knew that they, this scene was so important that, that they had to, to, to get this right. And so as they got the live actors there and the boats and the water and the net with, with nothing in it, they came up with an idea to put something in it they called the green burrito. And they put this large uh, green canvas looking bag full of balloons into the net. So you'd have this large object. And so green, you know, sometimes they can pull that out of their green screen. And they filmed the fishermen putting this, this net full of this green burrito into the boat. And when they got done, they turned that film footage over to the special effects guys and said, okay, can you do anything with this at all? Their deadline was fast approaching. They really had to get this done immediately. And one of the guys worked and worked and worked and worked until he came up with a new technique that he had never done, never thought of, to put those live fish, so to speak, through the, the miracle of CGI into that net to where you see them going into the boat. And I can tell you, having seen the, the live scene first and seeing how they did it behind the scene, it's incredible. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because it made me think they were trying to fill that net. They were trying to fill their own net to solve this problem. And they realized that they were at a spot that, that they needed some divine guidance. They needed the Holy Spirit to impress upon them. How can we solve this problem? And this wonderful special effect man came up with a solution. And as you go and see the finished product, it is amazing. It is fantastic. If you didn't know that those fish weren't real, you would know this backstory. So again, I apologize for this spoiler, but I think it's so important because the contrast that I took from that is what am I trying to fill my net up with? Should I maybe be looking to Jesus and doing what he asked of me, like, like he asked of Peter. And Peter, Peter was tired. He didn't want to go. He'd been out all night. That's when fishing's best. It's now the sun is up. You don't usually catch fish. And Jesus said, Peter, push out just a little bit for a, a, a launch. He lowers the net, not expecting anything. And lo and behold, Jesus fills that net up so much that it's filling up two boats, almost to the point of sinking. That makes me want to stop and think, am I doing what Jesus asks of me? Am I following Jesus when he calls? And am I trusting in him to fill my net up and not trusting on my own self? So Denise and I want to encourage you, spend some time in Luke chapter 5 today. Spend some time in the, in the Messiah if you have that uh, on that special episode. And if not, it's in the Desire of Ages also. We think that you'll be blessed. And again, if you have the opportunity, it's all free season one. Watch them all the way through season two. There's an app out there on their website. Uh, wonderfully done stuff. We can't endorse it enough. We think you'll be blessed. So with that, we're going to sign off for the next two weeks. Denise and I and Katie, we love all of our church family. We hope that you have a safe and wonderful rest of the Sabbath and a great week. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care.